this. Perfect. All right, we'll start to welcome everyone in. I see a few people starting to trickle in. Um, so we'll give it just a couple of minutes here while people populate. Um, so that's great. Thanks everyone for joining us this morning. Um, so we're pleased to have Alexander giving us an overview um, from the EM induction workshop, an EM induction workshop review, uh, unraveling electrical structure of the mantle with ionospheric, magnetospheric, and oceanic sources. Um, so Alexander, Alexander Greiber is a uh, Heisenberg Research Group leader at the Institute of Geophysics and Meteorology at the University of Cologne. Prior to that, Alexander was a research associate at ETH Zurich, a postdoc and a research assistant at GFZ, uh, and a postdoc and PhD student at the Free University of Berlin. Alexander's primary research um, revolves around imaging the subsurface, electrical conductivity structures across the crust and mantle using ground and satellite observations, as well as modeling EM induction effects due to space weather events. Uh, research foci include water uh, continent in the mantle, imaging, uh, sorry, water content in the mantle, <laughs> imaging of volcanic systems, uh, and exploration of geo resources. Alexander has been developing 3D EM modeling and inversion codes, um, which have been applied to study the Earth and extraterrestrial bodies. He's an active member of the ESA SWARM Mission uh, Science Consortium. And so thanks for uh, joining us today, Alexander, and I'll turn the floor over to you. Okay, thanks, Lindsay. Uh, thank, uh, hello to everyone who has joined this uh, seminar. Indeed, so uh, Lindsay already read the title and uh, I'll not spend much time on this, uh, uh, on this slide here, other than saying that that was uh, uh, AM induction workshop review uh, that I gave in Turkey in September. And it pretty much remains uh, the same presentation uh, for this seminar here. There will also be an EM review paper at some point. And uh, we will start by actually uh, going back uh, 133 years uh, and uh, looking at this uh, fantastic work on the diurnal variations of terrestrial magnetism uh, published by Arthur Schuster, uh, who was in the professor of physics in Owens College back then. And he was, uh, I think, the first one who has uh, applied the EM induction to probe the subsurface conductivity uh, the way we do, you know, up until now. And he established that, uh, you know, among other fantastic things he did, he also established that there is a strong evidence that the average conductivity is very small near the surface, but must be greater further down. And that observation probably comes from the uh, from the fact that there is an idea, but that there is a sort of a, a temperature gradient, and the conductivity on average uh, increases uh, with uh, with temperature. Right. So this was, as I said, uh, 30, 133 uh, years ago, and it was long before any other, I believe, EM or electric methods was established or widely practiced. And that was even before the, 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 the theory of continental drift was proposed or the most basic things about our Earth, such as inner and outer core, were discovered. So just to give it sort of a credit that how old this, uh, the EM induction sounding uh, really is. Since then, of course, a lot of things have changed. And one of the things that happened is that we have this Yaga division uh, where we, uh, you know, our community organizes uh, when possible uh, biannual meetings. Um, since more or less 50 years, I believe. And uh, ever since then, the topic of a sort of large scale, mental scale uh, EM induction of Earth and planets has been present. Uh, and here is a short summary of, of the previous uh, reviews um, up, up until sort of 2022, when it was uh, my honor and turn uh, to present the, this review. 
And uh, given that a lot of things have been already laid down in all these previous reviews, uh, I, of course, don't uh, intend to make it, you know, comprehensive throughout the history uh, of EM induction, but I will rather concentrate on the works that have been published uh, from 2012 to roughly present time. And we will be talking about large scales, so the scales from you know, roughly thousands of few thousands of kilometers to the global scale. We will not touch the topic of space weather or geomagnetically induced currents, because there was uh, another review uh, by Anna Keldert uh, published in 2020 on that topic. And uh, in this presentation, at least, I will also not be talking about applications of M induction for bodies other than Earth. And I think that might be a nice uh, topic for, for the next uh, review. So uh, we will, uh, again, uh, let's, let's come and look at the basics. And I think this, uh, these kinds of uh, conceptual slides and uh, images are, um, are very well known to, to most of the audience here, but nevertheless, um, let me uh, repeat this for those who, who might be new uh, to this topic. Uh, we are working with uh, natural electromagnetic variations that are induced uh, in the exterior of our planet. I mean, here the oceans uh, are also meant to be exterior. So let's say uh, outside of the solid part uh, of our planet, but excluding the, the outer core. So in particular, those primary currents in the ionos in the magnetosphere, ionosphere, or within the oceans, they will be inducing the, uh, the primary magnetic fields. And these primary magnetic fields, by virtue of uh, EM induction, uh, will induce the secondary electric currents, and in turn, secondary electric fields will be uh, also present. We are measuring the superposition of all these uh, fields, um, either at uh, ground observatories or at sea bottom stations or at some spacecrafts, uh, usually flying above the ionosphere but below the magnetospheric currents. And we want to use this to infer the uh, electrical conductivity uh, of the subsurface, so sigma as a function of uh, position vector r and uh, the this physical process is governed by partial differential equations uh, which we often refer to uh, as maxwell's equations although the the term that has been added by maxwell so the displacement currents is of course omitted in in this low frequency regime because it's uh, it's not relevant we are very lucky to have um, very rich and diverse electromagnetic environment around Earth. So I'm showing you here uh, a natural, uh, a, a power dense, uh, the power spectrum uh, of the radial magnetic field detected at the Honolulu Observatory. Uh, I took the almost 70 years uh, of, of data and, uh, oh, even more, right? Uh, yeah, well, Anyway, you can calculate the, the exact amount and, uh, and tra Fourier transformed them and then plotted this power spectral density. And as you will see, as you see very clearly, I mean, there are very pronounced peaks, but generally there is signal at almost all frequencies. And for, for, this, for the purpose of this presentation, of this review, uh, it's, uh, it's very convenient to split this whole spectrum into three bands. Um, uh, so the, the plane wave band, uh, where we mostly work with periods up to uh, a few hours, then there will be a daily band, and then there will be long period uh, or magnetospheric uh, band. And so depending on which period of the variation you use, you, you of course can access uh, sort of different uh, depths. Uh, theoretically, uh, if you uh, if you go to very long periods um, such as solar cycle, uh, you can actually sound all the way down to the core mantle boundary or 
approximate to, to this depth. And uh, another general thing is that uh, uh, for sort of certain reasons, uh, we can uh, legitimately assume that the source is plane wave uh, within this sort of uh, magnetic telluric band. And that simplifies a lot of things uh, methodologically. And that's one of the reasons why uh, MT method has been flourishing uh, so much. Uh, however, as you go to uh, longer periods uh, and to these sort of truly global sources, uh, there is no simple assumption about the source geometry and that creates um, certain methodological and um, technical obstacles, uh, which we will be also talking about a little bit. So generally, the source is not known uh, at these long periods, and we have to um, we have to somehow do something about it. So whenever the source is known, we can uh, or can be assumed to have a certain geometry, like plane wave. Uh, we can generally solve our inverse problem uh, in this sort of uh, very well-known form where we minimize uh, the data misfit and then we uh, regularize uh, our conductivity uh, sigma. And we minimize this um, with respect to the sigma. For these uh, long periods um, in the daily band and in the magnetospheric band, generally the source is uh, not known. And the problem actually becomes a lot more complicated because in addition to the subsurface conductivity sigma, you also have to solve for, the, uh, for these primary currents, JP. So, and I'll come back to this. Uh, when I will be talking about methodological developments in the field. But now let's come back and talk a little bit about data because a lot has happened on this uh, um, on the data side in the, in the last decade. Um, so first, um, the traditionally the main source of data for this uh, mental scale, large scale uh, geomagnetic studies have been ground geomagnetic observatories. And uh, we, um, we have um, a certain amount of them, and it has been pretty stable for the past uh, few decades. And so we, we, on average, have between sort of 120 and 150 of these permanent geomagnetic observatories. The problem, however, is that uh, this, uh, the distribution of these observatories is, is very non-uniform. Um, so you, in particular, you know, if you if you sort of look at the southern hemisphere and especially the oceans, there are huge gaps uh, where there is no data. There is also um, a lot of gaps in in time. So you know, here is an image from one of the recent papers by Gary Egbert and colleagues. And it basically, with black color, it shows the the, the gaps in these in these observatories, and and you can see that this is all but uh, nice continuous data. So you have a lot of uh, short gaps. Sometimes you have gaps that that sort of last decades, uh, or observatories stop to exist at certain point, uh, or they have been installed just recently, and all these kinds of uh, situations. Fortunately, we have. Uh, a very good uh, maintained databases of this uh, ground observatory data, which we can uh, really uh, use and remove the, the hurdle of dealing with all this um, calibration and sort of quality control uh, and really concentrate on, on the science. Another significant development that happened was the uh, advent of this sort of national scale uh, magnetotelluric arrays or sort of temporary uh, electromagnetic stations that are installed on a, on a regular or quasi-regular uh, grid and cover substantial areas, uh, sometimes the whole continents or you know large part parts of the of the uh, of the countries such as U.S. or or, or China uh, and the whole continent of of Australia. 
And this is, of course, unique. Uh, these are unique data sets. They uh, create a lot of opportunities. And I think we will be, we have already seen and we will be seeing more uh, of the high quality research output that is based on these data sets. Then uh, finally, we go to space and we also have uh, uh, occasionally uh, satellites that measure uh, magnetic data. Uh, and some of this uh, data uh, is suitable for uh, electromagnetic induction studies. Um, so we had uh, first uh, sort of um, satellites with uh, high quality magnetometers uh, at Pogo. That was, however, only scalar magnetometer. Then Maxat carried a magnetic, uh, a vector magnetometer and measured the vector magnetic field. But that was only for a very short period of time. And so that, that was quite limited uh, what one could do with this. Uh, and then we have the sort of the modern era of uh, satellite, magnetic uh, satellite measurements that is mostly spent by missions such as CHAMP in the first decade of the 21st century. Uh, then the other two missions uh, such as EarthSTAT and SEC. Uh, and finally, uh, since about 10 years, uh, we have the excellent uh, dedicated magnetic mission swarm that consists of three satellites, in fact, and it has been launched in November 2013 and it's still in operation. Here you see roughly the altitude of these altitudes of these satellites as a function of time. So, as I said, there was sort of this pre swarm era. Uh, of magnetic field measurements uh, starting at the beginning of 21st century. There was then some gap of few years and then swarm satellites have been launched. And if everything goes well, uh, at least one of these satellites, Swarm Bravo, should stay on orbit until uh, beginning of the next uh, decade. Um, recently, uh, the community has realized that uh, there are additional sources of magnetic field measurements at satellites um, that could be acquired by looking at the data from the so-called platform magnetometers. So these are um, the auxiliary instruments that are used for altitude control purposes, uh, but nearly all satellites have such magnetometers. And for some of these uh, missions, uh, there is actually uh, a good data coming from these platform magnetometers, provided that you can uh, calibrate it and, and get all the sort of data from the uh, satellite operators in first place. But this happened uh, for a few of these missions, uh, most notably missions like Cryosat, Grace Follow-on, uh, and Grace, and then Grace Follow-on. They are providing a reasonable um, uh, data uh, that could be used to do some science or to sort of as an add-on to this main uh, high quality dedicated missions. There's also a mission CSS, which is a Chinese uh, satellite uh, launched in 2018, around that time. Uh, and it's still in operation and it also provides both scalar and magnetic uh, data. So a lot about calibration and processing of these data sets uh, can be found in, in the publications uh, mentioned here. So um, the advantage of uh, satellites is, of course, that they fly globally. Uh, they fly all, all, over all locations eventually. I mean, not instantaneously, but eventually they cover all, um, all positions on Earth and they measure magnetic field. And that's, of course, extremely efficient as compared to this um, sort of uh, local uh, measurements, say, by ground magnetic observatories shown here with triangles. And so here you see basically the orbits of some of these satellites. Uh, the swarm is the primary one. And the other ones are these uh, missions where the uh, platform magnetometer data exists and it's available to, to the community. So um, 
and this is just one day of data. Uh, the problem, of course, is that as these satellites are not fixed relative to the mantle frame, to the sort of in, in the Earth rest frame, um, it creates uh, additional uh, challenges uh, which have to be tackled on the methodological side. So in summary, we have uh, geomagnetic observatories with long quality control time series. Uh, we, have, we, however, suffer from very uneven and generally sparse coverage. We have these temporary arrays, which uh, give us unprecedented local uh, resolution, but the stations are in the field only for a relatively short period of time. So we can still do a lot on the upper mantle side, but we cannot really uh, go much deeper than uh, than uh, asthenosphere and these satellites you know which are very which provide very accurate uh, data that covers the whole globe uh, but then we have to deal with this constantly moving platform uh, and the uh, associated um, consequences of this way of data collection and something that basically un uh, unraveled as an opportunity in the last decade are these platform magnetometers. There is potentially hundreds of satellites um, with platform magnetometer data. Uh, and this would give us, again, unprecedented resolution. But uh, we actually have to deal with uh, low accuracy and some problems with calibrating this data end up getting uh, getting it on a, on a stable basis from satellite operators. So this was it on the, on the data side. Uh, let's now move to the modeling and inversion and see what, what has been done uh, in, this, in this part of the, um, of, the, of the field. And again, a lot has been done. I think um, that the progress is generally uh, staggering. Uh, compared to what was there sort of uh, 10 or a little bit more years ago. So first of all, there were some uh, benchmark, collective benchmark studies, such as the study by Kelbert, uh, who tested uh, seven uh, global induction codes. Uh, however, there have been many new codes or the existing then codes have been developed much further um, and we have a, actually a good collection of codes that use different uh, discretization schemes. So pretty much as one would uh, have for sort of more local near surface uh, applied geophysics um, uh, applications. So we have finite difference codes, we have finite element codes, uh, we have also integral equations codes and sort of uh, mm, uh, mixed spectral finite element codes, both in frequency domain and in time domain. All other codes reported above are, um, are actually frequency domain codes. And we have had a few papers that I find particularly uh, important because they provide a very general uh, formalism for deriving the joint operators, uh, which are essential to implement the uh, in, uh, efficient 3D inversion uh, schemes. So um, one of the highlights, perhaps, of the uh, of the of the last decade in the field of um, you know forward modeling uh, was the development of um, codes that can handle this uh, mul the, the multi-scale nature of the. Uh, of the 3 dm induction on Earth. So we have uh, conductivity structures and, gra and gradients, which, uh, which are very local, but they're very significant. And we have a very broad band uh, that we have to model, you know, from theoretically from sort of uh, long period MT data all the way to the solar cycle to unravel all these scales from the surface down to the core. And, and of course, then we sort of sensitive to different scales uh, differently and modeling all of that within a single model is, is, is a challenge. Um, and there have been these, these sort of approaches where, you know, we, we, can, we can now implement these sort of locally um, refined uh, meshes and solve our equations on such meshes and take into account this multi-scale. 
uh, um, uh, multiple scales in, in a very efficient way. Another development was also the introduction of the codes that can work only on a part of a sphere, which is, say, particularly useful if you are, uh, you know, targeting a certain, you know, continent or um, continental scale survey. So you don't have to deal with the whole sphere uh, because you are not necessarily sensitive or have to do it. And then sort of these codes, which can operate only on a part of a sphere, are uh, more efficient. So another development which I think is worth mentioning is, um, and uh, which again is linked to the advent of this national uh, continental scale MT arrays, is the ability to model uh, 3D MT transfer functions in a spherical frame. Um, so at, at some point, basically, MT turned uh, completely to the uh, flat Earth assumption, where the implementation of a plane wave source is, is very simple. And it made a lot of sense for, uh, for most of the applications. But when you sort of zoom out back and look at this continental scale arrays, the Earth is simply not uh, flat at these scales, you know. And, and you might potentially get uh, some problems with, uh, with uh, you know, geographic, uh, with distortions due to geographic projections and, and, and other effects. And it's also difficult then to combine sort of flat earth uh, MT with a, with a longer period global transfer functions if you want to invert them together. And then there was a uh, few works which uh, introduced and implemented the source models uh, that allow one to calculate uh, valid 3 dmt transfer functions uh, in a spherical frame. So one of such approaches was based on an earlier idea by Feinberg and uh, colleagues uh, uh, by sort of uh, in, in exciting Earth with three polarizations, uh, which represent the um uniform magnetic fields along the uh, along the axis uh, shown here and then you can derive the uh, the impedance tensor uh, in, in in this way this parameterization works for um impedance tensor uh, in a relevant period range but it does not allow one to calculate tippers because there is an intrinsically non-zero uh, radial field uh, due to these uh, source polarizations. Then there was another uh, alternative way to represent the source that that actually allows one to also calculate tippers, and that is based on this uh, sheet current, so shown here with a dashed line that is above the earth, and the current is flowing, and this is a uniform current flowing in a theta direction. Uh, and then you can rotate this current uh, twice, uh, and then you still get the sort of uh, three orthogonal polarizations. And if you now solve your um, equations in a sphere due to these uh, currents, as shown, this one of these polarizations is shown here. So it shows the uh, longitudinal and latitudinal components of the of the uh, of this current system. So if you solve the Maxwell's equations due to these sources, uh, you will get a, a valid uh, MT uh, tipper transfer functions um, for, for a 3D uh, or a 1D uh, Earth uh, subsurface. And that brings me now to, um, to the case studies. So we have... Uh, we have uh, so sort of talked about how one can model uh, these large scale MT and GDS arrays and talked about these national scale uh, 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 programs. Uh, so let's see what 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 has been uh, what has been done here. So we are in this uh, period band here, so in this band that I call the plane wave band, uh, so roughly up to the periods of of few hours. And one example of uh, of sort of uh, 
looking at the scale and uh, MT transfer functions was a nice work of Juan Catal, who took actually a legacy data from the uh, what is known an AVAX array that was a, an array of roughly 50, 60 magnetometers that recorded uh, vector magnetic fields for nearly one year uh, at the end of 80s, beginning of 90s uh, simultaneously. Uh, and then the authors took this data, derived the uh, tippers of vertical magnetic transfer functions and inverted. So there are, of course, limitations because this, this grid is, is very sparse um, and the data needed, a lot, like, you know, again, sort of some processing and calibration. But I think this, this is a nice, very nice example of how one can use uh, legacy data and do some new science uh, given that we have these modern uh, tools that did not exist back then. We, uh, um, one of the master students that I co-advised, Filippo Cicchetti, also did uh, the same exercise, uh, but we used this sort of spherical um, mesh and solved the equations in a spherical frame and used these locally refined meshes and also obtained some uh, reasonable uh, conductivity structures subject to the limitations of the data quality and the survey layout. Uh, another uh, uh, prime example of, of, of in, in, in this uh, sort of uh, uh, field was, of course, the US array uh, that is near its completion by now. And a lot of uh, US groups have uh, uh, created um, models based on this data. So this data is open access and that's really amazing, I think. So you can just go and download all these transfer functions and they are, you know, quality controlled, uh, processed, and there is a lot of documentation. Uh, so this is really a fantastic example. Um, so, and then the Murphy et al with colleagues, Kelbert uh, with colleagues, they, they inverted parts of this array um, and later merged them to create sort of the uh, the conductivity model for the uh, mainland uh, US. Um, Young and Egbert, they have also uh, worked with this array. So they, for instance, decimated this array. Um, so they were left with roughly 500 stations and also um, inverted uh, these for the uh, deep mental uh, conductivity structures and interpreted them in terms of uh, mental water content. Uh, another example, uh, the one where uh, I was uh, involved in, uh, was uh, again the inversion of this US array. So we took uh, all the high quality stations that existed as of uh, October 2022 and we also inverted them using a new uh, spherical uh, frame 3DMT inversion code. And these are just a few uh, slices through this model. Um, and there is a, a now a publication uh, available on, on this. Right, so uh, that was it for sort of MT slash uh, tipper. Um, inversions on these large um, scales. Um, let's come to another type of source, uh, which is relatively new. Uh, well, in fact, it appeared as an EM induction source uh, in the last decade. Um, some people had an idea that it could be used as an EM induction source, but it was proven to be possible uh, to use it only in the last decade. And these are the uh, oceanic sources. In particular, uh, if you look around these um, narrow bands of tw 12 and uh, 24 hours, you will see a lot of spikes, uh, a lot of sort of uh, um, strong periodic signals uh, in these bands. And many of them are associated with, um, much of this signal is associated with ionospheric uh, variations. But some of these spikes are also due to the um, oceanic tides, which also exist uh, in, in these bands. 
So the idea and motivation behind using uh, oceanic sources um, is again goes back to the fact that we have very little data uh, from the oceans. There have been brilliant, um, you know, uh, marine MT uh, studies, uh, which you know made it to high impact journals and 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 generally um, sort of uh, unraveled a lot of new details about suboceanic uh, mantle. But it's it's very limited uh, what you can do in terms of marine MT. I mean, you can never do something like US array uh, in the middle of the Pacific. Um, therefore, large part, uh, largest part of the oceanic mantle remains um, sort of terra incognita for us. And I think that the only way to sort of get a global picture on the suboceanic mantle, global electrical uh, structure of the suboceanic mantle is by using these uh, oceanic sources which we can detect and map at satellites. And so satellites flying all over their oceans uh, can therefore allow us some, um, some estimates of electrical conductivity structure uh, under the oceans. So the physics behind this is, um, is what we call motional induction. And in fact, there was recently a review dedicated to motionally induced signals. Uh, I believe it was uh, by Minami uh, 2017. Um, but I still give you a, sort of a very short introduction in, 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 into the physics behind this phenomenon. So imagine you have a electrically conductive ocean water that flows. Uh, for instance, due to the oceanic tides. So this flow U, um, and it flows in the presence of the ambient magnetic field. Uh, and then uh, actually you can invoke some simple physical laws to show that you induce currents uh, within the ocean due to this flow in the presence of the ambient field. And these currents, they couple to the, uh, to the subsurface below oceans so they induce currents in the, in the subsurface and these currents, they induce, of course, secondary magnetic fields. And these are the secondary magnetic fields which we want to, uh, to map uh, with satellites or sea bottom stations uh, and use to image the, uh, the suboceanic mantle. Um, this is a, generally a complex source uh, which depends on the structure and geometry of the ambient magnetic field and the particular flow um, due to different tidal constituents. Uh, but we actually happen to know this source very well because we know to a good degree the, the main uh, you know, magnetic field, mostly generated within the core, and it remains static at the time scales. Uh, which we consider here. Um, and then we also know the, the tidal transport of the, of the ocean water. Um, in fact, uh, one of our colleagues, Gary Egbert, has done a lot of, um, you know, has, 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 has done seminal contributions in the field of the uh, oceanic tides. And uh, the, um, he's one of the authors and primary author perhaps of this so-called TPXO model that tells you exactly how oceanic water moves for different tides. So you can reconstruct the current, this primary current due to the oceanic tides and use this uh, for EM induction purposes. And so this current was shown just on the, on the previous animation. Um, these signals are very small. In general, um, you know, we are talking about uh, mostly maximum few nanotesla signals, and they are even smaller at the satellite uh, magnitude. Uh, but we can detect them uh, because we know the period of these signals very well, and mo not much happens, uh, and there are not there are no other strong sources at these signals. So we can be pretty sure by doing a special sort of data selection and 
pre-processing of the satellite data that we are mostly seeing these signals due to the oceanic tides and not something else. There is, of course, some contamination and noise, but you can tell yourself how well we can constrain this data by looking at these animations, which shows the radial magnetic field at the altitude of 430 kilometers, which is an average uh, swarm uh, satellite altitude. And it compares the observed uh, radial component, so the one that was extracted from the satellite data, with the field that was simulated. So this is a pure numerical uh, simulation uh, of this source. And so you will find the staggering uh, agreement between these two. And you can easily do the, the, the very simple exercise to establish that this is indeed a, uh, a NEM induction source. Uh, for the suboceanic mantle by doing you know this kind of sensitivity study where the suboceanic mantle can be uh, parameterized by using two layers only so the lithosphere and asthenosphere and then you can vary conductivity of the lithosphere versus conductivity of the asthenosphere and calculate the RMS between these two signals so simulated and observed and you will find a definite minimum uh, in, 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 this, in, in this image, which corresponds to a very resistive lithosphere and very and much more conductive asthenosphere, which is something that we, of course, expect uh, from, uh, from the nature. So I don't have much more time to go into this, but I uh, list here the, uh, the, 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 some of the works uh, that were sort of... Um, published in this field and it all started roughly around 2014 2015 when these signals could definitely be mapped uh, or extracted from satellite data with a very high precision and and then they were sort of shown to be a feasible uh, em induction source and just the last year we had a publication of the uh, of, from the um, Zakel and uh, Jakub Pelimski and other colleagues from Prague who already sort of implemented a 3D inversion scheme for these uh, tidal magnetic signals, uh, which shows a really uh, a huge progress that has been made in just uh, roughly seven, eight years. Another uh, development that is a bit sort of tangential to um, to the M induction activities or to sort of the imaging per se, but I think it's the one that is very important and can help improve our models. Um, and that is um, the sort of more elaborate and realistic conductivity models of the ocean and sediments. So you, 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 you cannot, of course, on, on, on this very large uh, scale, you have to assume and fix the ocean and, and sediments. And the better uh, models of these two layers you have, uh, the more accurate your mental and uh, crustal models will be later. And uh, there has been a, a good progress also on this front. And in particular, in the last five, six years, where, you know, very elaborate, uh, physics-based models of the oceanic and uh, marine sediments conductivities have been published. Uh, and so I have myself a publication in, in 2021 that sort of summarizes this progress in this table and also presents one of such uh, models. So this is an example of uh, vertical uh, ocean conductance uh, map so it goes from sort of zero to uh, 20,000 siemens uh, and you can see of course that to first order it's controlled by the bathymetry um, but there are also variations uh, due to the climatology so due to the temperature of the ocean and, and salinity you will see them on the next slide and importantly uh, here is there is also a model of marine sediments conductance which we usually tend to completely ignore uh, when we work uh, with you know, land or even marine data. But in some regions of our planet, the, especially at the margins, the conductance of the sediments is, is, is very substantial. And you, 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 you would really want to include this in your model 
uh, if you work with the data that is measured, uh, you know, around the coast, uh, close to the coast or above the ocean, like the oceanic tides. This is an example of the depth averaged conductivity of the ocean. Uh, and here you can validate this uh, ubiquitous assumption that the ocean is sort of uh, three siemens per meter or 3.2 siemens per meter or 3.3, uh, choose whatever you want. Uh, you will see that in reality, there are some substantial variations uh, in, the, in the ocean uh, conductivity. This is the sort of the depth averaged uh, model shown here. Uh, and this is the um, longit this is the section, the depth section versus longitude. So we averaged over all uh, long sorry versus latitude. So we, we averaged over all longitudes. And here you can, uh, of course, see the uh, the effect of the thermocline and increased salinity in the low and tropical uh, latitudes. Uh, which of course then makes the ocean uh, a lot more uh, conductive than it is in the mid and upper latitudes or deeper uh, closer to the sea bottom. Okay, so uh, we have covered uh, the magnetic telluric and motional induced sources. And now we come to the ionospheric and magnetospheric sources to, the, to these long period bands that allow us to go deeper uh, into the mental transition zone and lower mantle. But before doing that, it's very important to, um, to, to say here, and I said this kind of, uh, that, that we generally don't know the, the sources. So we, we not only have to recover the conductivity, we also need to uh, do inversion of some kind to understand and constrain the source structure. And to show you why this is important, uh, we can look at uh, the most sort of common way of doing these global induction studies, the so-called C responses or GDS responses. Uh, they are called sort of or Z over H method responses. Uh, so let's derive them, and then let's look why uh, the assumption on the simplistic sor source structure that is behind these responses um, is really uh, not the best. So we have to define some things before we proceed. Uh, and um, so bear with me, this is a little bit technical, um, if you, especially if you are not from the from this field, but 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 you will see the point later. So above the ground and in the source-free region, we our field is is curl-free, so it satisfies this equation. And following from that, uh, you can then represent your vector magnetic field B as a gradient of the of the potential. So the field is curl-free, and hence it's a it's a potential field. So by virtue of the Gauss law, of course, the, it's also a divergence-free field. And therefore, this scalar potential V satisfies the, the Laplace equation, okay? And uh, the, the Gauss, uh, at the beginning of 90s, in the middle of the 90th century, has shown that um, based on this sort of potential field representation, you can write down uh, the magnetic field as a, a superposition of the external and internal parts. So the external part is from the field that is external to the observer. So this is our inducing source field. And the internal field is the field that is being induced uh, by this external field. So you, you will note here that the external field depends on the position and, and frequency, but the internal field also depends on the position frequency. It also depends on the subsurface conductivity. So I will often omit these dependencies for, for brevity. So then you can write the components of these fields uh, as a sums of uh, some geometric factors, which are given by the spherical harmonic functions, so S and M. 
the, the this function uh, is a product of the is this complex spherical harmonic function it's a product of uh, associated Legendre polynomials and this uh, exponential here and it's again this is a an external part and this is an internal part so induced part this is an inducing part this is for the radial component and for the horizontal components and this double sum uh here is denoted with this uh, with this single sum uh, and these subscripts here so this works above the earth where the field is potential as you go into the earth uh, the potential field representation no longer works uh, but you can show that uh, right below the surface you can express the components of the magnetic fields uh, as these sums so again you see here the external field coefficients you see here the spherical harmonic functions or the gradient of the spherical harmonic functions for the horizontal components uh, but instead of the internal coefficients here you introduce this uh, spectral impedance and there are some other uh, things here which are not important uh, at this point but this uh, spectral coefficient uh, is a function of uh, radius, uh, frequency, and conductivity. And it's something that has been known for, for a pretty long time. Now, assume that your external field uh, consists only uh, of a single spherical harmonic. So the whole field can be described by a single spherical harmonic function of degree n and order m. And then further, we can introduce the the c response function which which relates to the spectral impedance in this sort of simple way then the local c response function can be estimated from the two components of the magnetic field measured at the surface of of the planet so namely you can relate the radial and the horizontal component fields and multiply them by the sort of certain um scalar factor here and you will get this so-called cn response uh, so it's a it's also it's a global transfer function so it's, it's a local transfer function uh that that describes uh, that can be used for for the sounding if you now assume that the geometry of your inducing field is described by the first zonal harmonic so this n um so S10 coefficient or P10 in this case, they're, they're equal. Uh, then we get this uh, C1 response uh, expressed here. So again, you see the ratio of the radial to the horizontal component and this, this factor here. And this is exactly what is known as a Z, Z, Z over H method that was uh, first elaborated by Banks in 1969 or sometimes also people call this a gds response okay so this has been the basis for the large-scale electromagnetic induction for for many decades so let's see what's the problem with this with these methods and how it's related to the complex sources uh, that we have in the reality so again the this response is only valid it's only valid if the whole inducing external field is coming from a single first zonal harmonic, P10. And this is kind of uh, partially true because one of the dominant sources in this, for instance, long period magnetospheric band uh, is this uh, um, so called ring current, ring magnetos magnetospheric ring current. And large part of this current can be indeed described by a single uh, zonal harmonic. But it's actually, as we learn more and more about these external current systems, we realize also that this assumption uh, is really not that accurate. So in reality, the source is always more complex than, than this P10 uh, assumption would, would, would tell you and it's even more complex at mid geomagnetic latitude so away from from this uh, high latitude uh, uh, polar currents um, 
However, assuming this geometry is probably still okay for global average 1D models because you can sort of average these source effects when you derive a, a, a global average response and then invert it for the global average uh, conductivity profile. But I really think it's not okay to use these local responses for uh, global or regional 3D studies. And that's and the reason it's not okay is because uh, if you do a, a, a 3D inversion, um, is the problem is highly non-unique uh, as always, and we have only a handful of these uh, uh, stations usually that provide us sufficiently uh, the data of sufficient quality and longevity to derive these long period responses. The source effects on top of that. Uh, the, the, the effects uh, in the field that are not due to this uh, first zonal uh, harmonic uh, function are much stronger than the responses uh, from the 3D deep mantle anomalies. So you will see it on the next slide. And in this case, you really, when you invert this C1 responses in 3D uh, in a highly non-unique um, sort of problem, with such a strong source effects and very small 3D EM induction effects from the deep mantle, the first thing you do, you propagate the source effects into your conductivity model. And you have no way to control this because you, you made an assumption that your source is just due to a single spherical harmonic. So you already assumed that. So everything that does not fit this assumption must go into your subsurface somehow. And therefore, it's impossible really in these 3D models to discriminate between source effects and 3D conductivity. You can do a very careful pre-processing. You can try to minimize these effects um, and, and sort of some groups really did a, and some, there are some publications and groups who did a very careful uh, sort of data selection, pre-processing, inversion tests, um, but in general, in general, that's that's sort of uh, the problem. And to show you uh, an example with, with real data, here I have um, took I've taken the mid latitude uh, observatories globally. So these roughly 100, 130 observatories uh, from the year of uh, 2014, roughly to. Uh, the beginning of uh, 2020. So seven years of data. I took only meet uh, latitude geomagnetic observatories where this P10 source is supposed to be dominant. And I determined uh, these, these spherical harmonic coefficients for two different models. So in one model, I took only one spherical harmonic coefficient, so P10 coefficient. And in the other model, I took 15 uh, spherical harmonic coefficient. So I parameterized my source with 15 uh, terms as opposed to only one term as you would do in the ZH uh, method. And I'm plotting here the R squared uh, coefficient of determination, which roughly shows me the proportion of the variance that I explained in the observed fields uh, at the ground observatories. And you can see that while for my more realistic source model with 15 terms, I explain almost consistently more than 90% of the variance in the external field. With the model where the source is parameterized with P10, I, you know, I explain a lot less uh, of the variance and that varies a lot. So there are extended periods in time where I can explain only 20 or even less percent uh, of the variance with, with this model. So the majority of the observed field is not from this P10 spherical harmonic coefficient, uh, is not due to the P10 source. And that's why, you know, if you take and universally assume that the source is at all times P10, uh, you are mixing the times where your source is indeed dominated by P10 harmonic with the times where the source is 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 to a large extent not from P10 harmonic. 
So what is the solution to this? Uh, I think uh, the solution, and that was, you know, I'm not the first one who sort of uh, made this uh, observation. And on the next slide, uh, you will see uh, some more about that. But I think that the only solution, and that was already postulated in many previous works, is to acknowledge that the source is more complicated and to invest more time and efforts into methods which can handle these complex but more realistic sources. And uh, uh, while here, I mean, a lot has been done also in the past decade um, on, on this front. Uh, and there are some uh, sort of um, um, uh, references that I provide here. Uh, so generally, even staying with the conventional spherical harmonic uh, basis, uh, you can uh, parameterize the sources with a much more um, elaborated models, which consist of uh, many spherical harmonic coefficients. And, you know, there have been some uh, preliminary efforts in this direction done by Niels Olsen and uh, Ulrich Schmucke uh, at the end of 20th century. And then there have been a, another uh, substantial works uh, by Pute and, and Kuvshinov and by Guzavena et al. Uh, more recently. Uh, so this is an example, for instance, of um, equivalent uh, current system due to the solar quiet uh, source. Um, so this is the source that that exists in the daily band. So it's an ionospheric source, but uh, but but the, the problem is is the same. There have been also very important, I think, developments where um, authors and some of the researchers uh, took the, the physics-based models of ionosphere in this case and tried to derive the special basis based on the uh, physics-based models of, of the ionosphere. There have been always, there have always, there have also been works where uh, sort of more complex um, basis functions based on the current loops uh, or similar have been used to account for the complexity in, in the source. Um, so this is an example for the quiet, uh, solar quiet uh, source. Uh, however, I mean, it's, it's, it's a dominant source when the magnetic conditions are very quiet. But when the but when we have a disturbed magnetically disturbed days, then then the source is much more complex. And this is, for instance, what was shown uh, by Gary Egbert et al., where they uh, used this physics-based uh, uh, source representation, and they can sort of represent the sources both during the magnetically quiet and magnetically disturbed uh, con uh, conditions. So how do you handle this problem then? I mean, okay, you can uh, create sort of a more elaborate model of the source, um, but how do you then also uh, invert for the source and conductivity at the same time? So then we have this problem where, you know, uh, as I said, we have to invert for both conductivity and the, and the source current. And this is, and your sort of conventional minimization problem, uh, nonlinear least squares problem becomes uh, the so-called separable non-least squares problem, uh, where the source coefficients enter the system linearly because Maxwell's equations are linear relative to the uh, extraneous uh, source current density, and they are non-linear with respect to the conductivity. And that's actually something that saves us because uh, this observation allows us to uh, to find efficient ways for solving these these kind of problems. The simplest uh, approach to determine both uh, external currents and conductivities and uh, retain the the cons consistency sort of between the two um, without sort of resorting to these oversimplified source model source geometry assumptions is the so-called alternating approach, where you start the, uh, the problem by assuming a certain uh, electrical conductivity model, uh, sigma zero. Then you have to solve this equation. So you, you, you say, I, I know my conductivity to a certain degree, 
then you have to solve only for the uh, JP here and the problem becomes linear. So you just solve a linear uh, least squares problem. You determine JP, this is uh, step two. And then you use this estimated JP to update your conductivity model. So to go from sigma zero to some sigma tilde here. And then you use this updated conductivity to go back to uh, at, at the step one again and, and again determine the, the, the source. And so this kind of alternating approach should, in theory, lead you to, um, to uh, optimal conductivity and the source uh, currents, at least optimal in a, in, a, in a least square sense. And this approach has been uh, already used. Uh, and it basically kicked off. Uh, with this uh, work of Koch and Kupshinov 2013, where they applied it to the ionospheric uh, solar quiet signals. Uh, and then it was generalized to arbitrary sources with spherical harmonic uh, basis functions uh, a few years later. And then there was um, some other works where these inversions were implemented for jointly for SQ and magnetospheric signals. Lately, uh, this was also implemented for, um, uh, for the physics-based uh, basis functions uh, by Jean Catal. And also recently, there was a formulation of this sort of whole scheme uh, done in time domain, which allows one to uh, efficiently incorporate uh, satellite data into the scheme. So all previous works, they were based on the ground data. Uh, there are other methods uh, other than this alternating approach that you can use to solve the separable nonlinear least squares problems, uh, the so-called variable projection. So the variable projection is actually the most rigorous and efficient way to address uh, these problems. It requires quite a bit of um, sort of um, additional um, uh, work to implement it. Uh, but the advantage of this method is that first it converges much faster uh, than, than this uh, sort of uh, naive alternating approach. And second advantage is that it automatically retains the consistency between the conductivity and the source and the external source. Uh, so we have recently uh, got the paper on this uh, method applied to the uh, to the M induction uh, sounding problems accepted in the EPS journal. So hopefully it will be out soon. So let's look at some of the um, case studies from from these long period bands, and that will basically complete my uh, review presentation and and this talk. So this was the work by Koch and Kupshin of 2015, where they again used this AVAX uh, data uh, from Australia uh, that was used in one of the uh, earlier mentioned studies for deriving tippers and doing this sort of MT inversion. Here, authors used this data to derive the daily uh, period, uh, um, the, the responses at the daily periods due to the ionospheric current systems and invert for the conductivity uh, in the layers um, deeper down. Uh, this was kind of developed a bit further and, uh, and applied to, to other data by Guzavina et al. Uh, so here are some examples of, of, of the conductivity profiles from different locations uh, in Australia, Honolulu, US. Um, and there have been also other methodological developments to deal with these complex sources. Another uh, example from the work of uh, Gary Egbert and, and, and colleagues who again used these daily variations and these physics-based uh, uh, basis functions that they have uh, elaborated on in the 2021 and used subsequently these functions to invert for the uh, conductivity structure in the asthenosphere and mental transition zone. 
uh, and sort of uh, estimate the, the water content. At the uh, EM induction workshop in, in Turkey, there were also some uh, contributions from colleagues uh, in Prague, from Prague and Japan, who sort of follow similar uh, ideas and try to uh, also uh, use these more elaborated source models and methods that can handle these complex sources and invert for the uh, for the uh, regional uh, mental conductivity with these uh, ionospheric sources. So let's go to the magnetospheric sources now. Uh, so we are coming to this uh, long period band, so periods from uh, one day roughly all the way up to the solar cycle. And the first uh, the first thing that that one can mention here is that, uh, you can use these sources uh, to derive sort of the first the global average uh, conductivity profile, and and this is useful for things like estimating the uh, the, the the certain phase transitions in the uh, in the deep mantle or um, estimating the average uh, water content of the upper mantle and mantle transition zone. So there is a lot of science that you can do. Uh, with these um, global 1D average profiles, but um, they are also useful as a, as a sort of starting point for this uh, more elaborate uh, 3D um, inversions. And a lot of these profiles have been published uh, in the past decade. So I'm showing here just a, a, a small selection uh, of these works. Uh, which used uh, um, observatory and satellite data uh, and inverted for the magnetospheric uh, long period variations. There have also been uh, efforts which tried to combine the magnetospheric uh, variations with, say, oceanic tides and derive uh, global uh, conductivity models, which, which sort of uh, are sensitive to the whole depth column. Uh, not only uh, the deeper part uh, uh, of of the of the mantle, um, and finally there were works which also tried to go as far uh, into the past and use very very long uh, time series and periods up to eleven years uh, to try and reach the 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 lower mantle, the lowermost part of the lower mantle. Um, there was a generation of uh, 3D, uh, global 3D models, uh, also using sort of different uh, approaches, sometimes uh, just sort of taking this P10 source and the ground data, sometimes sort of trying to do uh, more elaborate work on the, on the sources, trying to combine observatory and swarm and, and, and satellite data. Um, there are some intermediate uh, sort of approaches where the ground-based data is used, but there is a lot of work invested into trying and clean the data from these uh, non-P10 source effects, such as the work by Kelbert et, uh, et al. Uh, and also, um, yeah. All these models, I would say, still suffer from uh, some resolution problems. Some of these models perhaps uh, contain some the source effects, uh, and you know, generally, I would say we still need to do more work to to bring them together and uh, sort of try to uh, to do our best um, in in this direction. So there have been some um, semi-global studies over regionally. Uh, people took some data regionally and derived these GDS responses and even sometimes combined them with MT responses, such as in the work by uh, Matsuno et al. Um, and then sort of trying to do uh, this combined MT GDS inversion uh, for the conductivity of the um, upper mantle and transition zone. This was sort of a collection of 1D uh, profiles. I mean, here, uh, research, the colleagues from Japan, they have used even the uh, data from the sea bottom cables 
and uh, sort of derive this uh, this model from the Pacific in the Pacific region. Some efforts uh, were also uh, done in uh, in China, uh, where sort of there is a lot more data um, and and these local profiles and and conductivity uh, estimations have been derived and sort of authors try to interpret them in terms of uh, thermochemical effects uh, in the in the mantle and again uh, similar work just from a uh, different part of the world so in 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 in, in Australian region uh, Koyama et al uh, did this semi global uh, inversion or more sort of continental scale inversion for the conductivity variations in the uh, in the transition zone and lower mantle and finally of course it goes to uh to the next step where we uh would like to not concentrate on a single band be it mt band daily band or magnetospheric band we would like to to combine all these sources uh, and gain uh, the uh, combined sensitivity to the whole depth column uh, try to you know um, take advantage of the complementary sensitivities that exist in all of these different sources and periods and this is a very simple synthetic example uh, which inverts uh, signals from the magnetospheric band daily band and mt band separately and then it does the same uh, jointly and you can see how nice uh, your uh, conductivity uh, is throughout the, the depth column. Uh, there have been already some of these uh, studies uh, where different types of sources have been uh, jointly inverted. Um, they are all more or less uh, 1D. I mean, they, they can have a 3D forward operator to model, for instance, the realistic uh, responses from the heterogeneous ocean or sediments, but the subsurface conductivity is parameterized as 1D. So I would say that uh, the development in this direction and the extension of this approach is to, to a 3D uh, would be a challenge for the next uh, for the next decade. And so this brings me to conclusions. So we have uh, looked with you uh, at uh, a lot of interesting and impressive works that sort of highlight the progress that has been made in this field. And I have summarized here uh, some of the highlights uh, of the past decade and some of the challenges uh, for the next decade. And with this, I, I, yeah, I would like to finish my presentation. So thank you for your attention. Many thanks, Alexander. This was an excellent talk. I'm sure sparked some ideas and I already see some questions um, coming in from folks. If anybody wants to raise your hand in the Zoom window, um, I can invite you to actually uh, jump in and, and chat with Alexander. It's a little more engaging than me uh, reading off all of the questions. Uh, so I'll give folks a moment if you'd like to do that. I see there's a question from um, Alan Chave. Alan, if you'd like to raise your hand, you're welcome to, and I can invite you on in. Um, if not, I will read off your question. Perfect. Hey, Alan. Yeah, the point I raised is that there's a considerable body of knowledge now that there is a big difference between the Atlantic and Pacific basins. Uh, the Atlantic basin is electrically isolated from the mantle. In other words, the ocean is not connected to the mantle. Uh, whereas in the Pacific, that's not true. It's the opposite. And the difference, of course, is there are no subduction zones in the Atlantic. And there are, are a lot of subduction zones in the Pacific. And they, they constitute a conductive pathway from the ocean into the mantle. Your, the, the scale of the methods you presented here, obviously, are not going to resolve something like that. But it's going to have a huge effect on the results. Have you thought about parameterizing this and sticking it into the models independent of the of of, of what the data say? Right, right. That's an interesting point. I, I've never thought about it actually. Um, yeah, I, 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 it would be hard to to answer this uh, right away because I, I really never thought that there, there could be. Uh, you know, a, a decisive difference uh, due to the fact there is no subduction in the Pacific. Um, in the oh, sorry, Atlantic. In the, the Atlantic, yeah. Um, 
No, I, I don't know, but I'm, I'm you know, I'm uh, thanks for bringing this up. Uh, I don't know if you have any, yeah, or sort of more specific ideas how one could approach that and what implications this might have uh, for the studies out there or for future studies, then then I'd be I'd be happy to hear it here or elsewhere, you know, from you. Um, but I myself haven't I, thought. I, I, I'm I not a modeler. I, I'm not a modeler and I don't have any specifics on how to do it. But uh, uh, there is a lot of evidence from the magnetotelluric studies in the oceans going back to the 1970s, in fact. Okay. I'll give it I'll give it a thought. So thanks for uh, for bringing this up. Thanks, Alan. Give other folks a chance. Um, I actually have a question for you. I'd be very curious to hear your thoughts on, you know, the impacts. So as we as you talked about the unknown source on much more sort of the local and exploration scales is, you know, magnetotelurics is used a lot in exploration type problems. Mm -hmm. And I don't know mm -hmm. if you've got examples or, or thoughts or things that uh, this community should be thinking about in the context of those problems as well. Um, so what, what do you mean? Like, like, do you mean specifically MT or some control source where you do not have a full control on the source? <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking more, sort. yeah, thinking more um, MT and, and tipper type experiments and um, yeah, but on the, the local, perhaps more, you know, mineral exploration scale, those, those sorts of scales. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's the same problem. I, I mean, I think generally, you know, like the, the un, unlike for this very long period, you know, magnetospheric band or ionospheric band, where the the source the 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 deviations from the simplified you know source models that we have in reality is is a first order uh, deviation that that we should not ignore you know in other words you know we should really care about the source first and then go and sort of invert for conductivity once we understand the source in this mt band i think your your source is predominantly one d i mean if you you know if you like maybe sort of um like like this simple experiment here you know it shows that that you know you can i mean how much of the i think something like that has been actually done for mt or is consistently done by people who are processing data like how much of the field variance you explain by the uh sort of plane wave uh, polarizations. I think you will be explaining like 80 or 90%, right? Um, so something like here with 15 uh, polarizations, if you wish. Um, so so then, then, then really a non-plane wave effects are secondary. Uh, how to handle them, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, they have been always, you know, I also have a section in the review paper which actually lists some of the works done on studying the MT source effects and and people have detected some MT source effects um, in the in the real data but I don't know if that's what you were referring to but it's certainly less of a problem in the plane wave band than mm -hmm. it is in these long period bands you know um, so I, I I yeah sorry that was not perhaps what you were asking. Um... No, I, I appreciate that. I think that's a, a helpful overview and, and some food for thought. Uh, so we'll look forward to seeing your paper. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I see some thanks coming in. I don't see too many other questions at this point, um, but I'm sure if you if you have some uh, coming up, reaching out to Alexander uh, would be welcomed and we can continue conversations from there. Um, so thanks again, Alexander. Much appreciated your presentation and uh, we'll have the recording up for folks to, to follow up later on. Right. Right. Yeah. All right. Thanks. See you later. Bye -bye. Have a nice day all. Yeah.